Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Clark Irvin, the executive director of the Aspen Security Forum. I'm very grateful to all of you for sticking with us. Uh, uh, during the course of the forum so far, we've solved all of the geopolitical problems the country faces, but the one strategic challenge that we have not been able to surpass is that of the weather. And so, finally, it is beginning to cooperate. As you see, Admiral Grenard is here, so thank you very much for your patience. I'm going to be very brief to introduce tonight's program. We're very pleased to have the chief executive officers of one of our sponsors, Raytheon Company. We're very pleased to have to introduce uh, tonight's uh, session with Admiral Grenard. Dr. Tom Kennedy, who is the CEO of Raytheon Company. He himself is a veteran of our military, having served in the Air Force. Uh, he is a 31-year veteran of the Raytheon Company, and as you know, it's one of the world's leaders in defense, uh, the defense industry. And so with that, uh, my uh, welcome to all of you, and uh, Tom, take it away. Clark, uh, thanks for the uh, introduction, and uh, also thank you and Walter for putting together one heck of an event. Can we give these two guys a round of applause? Thank you. And Raytheon is a proud to be a partner of the Aspen Security Forum. And last year we did it, did it again this year, and uh, we're set to do it again next year. So you got my uh, my vote, okay? Great. Well, uh, for the next uh, hour, we're going to be focusing on some challenges and the uh, this. The person that's going to uh, be uh, on the stage here today has uh, just had a major challenge, and that was the challenge of, of getting here and, and landing. And uh, uh, as he said, uh, he, he wants to remain a submariner versus a, a pilot, so I understand why. So. But the uh, this, this session, next session, and it's the last session of the day, but I can tell you it's not the least. It's the best session for the day, so I'm setting you up here, setting the bar pretty high. And it's uh, going to focus next hour on challenges facing the U.S. Navy. And we'll be doing so, again, with the uh, foremost authority. That's Admiral Jonathan Greenert. He's the Chief Naval Officer uh, for Operations. And uh, Admiral Greenert is a native of Butler, Pennsylvania. And he served at every uh, level of command, including command of the USS Honolulu, 7th Fleet, U.S. Fleet Forces Command, and now is the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. As CNO, the Admiral is responsible to the Secretary of the Navy for the command, utilization of resources, and operating efficiency of the Navy's operating forces. A member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Greenert is the principal naval advisor to the President and to the Secretary of the Navy on the conduct of war. The Admiral is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, and he began his career as a submariner. And I think he's going to remain a submariner after that flight in, uh, in the storm tonight coming in. And his many honors include being awarded the Vice Admiral Scottsdale Award for Inspirational Leadership. Our Navy could not be in better hands. And for this session, there is no one better to walk us through the challenges and threats facing the U.S. Navy and what it is doing to counter them. Moderating the discussion is a leader in his own field, author and Washington Post columnist and associate editor David Ignatius. And I'm going to give a plug. He's got a great book out called The uh, Director. And if you haven't bought it yet, it's on for sale in the, uh, across, the, uh, across the room here. I get a dollar for every dumb. No, <laughs> moderating the discussion is a leader in his own field. OK, David, and I'm uh, glad you'll do that for us today. So now will you please join me in welcoming Admiral Jonathan Greenert and David Ignatius. Thank you. So uh, a few minutes ago, uh, you literally heard the words, the eagle has landed. Um, and I just want to uh, give a, a shout out to Clark Irvin and the staff at the Aspen Institute uh, for uh, dealing with the uncertainty of Admiral Greenert's arrival, and also to thank General Charles Jacoby, uh, the commander of NORTHCOM, who is uh, sitting in the front row, but was prepared to be sitting next to the moderator uh, if Admiral Greenert had not, had not been able to, to land. So, uh, you know, that we talk about the agility of our military forces. They're always prepared. Uh, tonight we saw a great uh, example of that. So I want to get right into our, our discussion uh, because we do want to uh, break uh, so people can get to other uh, events at, at 6.30. Uh, 
Um, we've been talking uh, all week or the last three days about security issues. If you were here in Greenwall Pavilion Wednesday night, you know that we've been doing a four-star version of the Army-Navy game. Uh, we had General Odierno, the Army Chief of Staff, uh, and now we have Admiral Greener, the, the CNO. And in between, we had the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Dempsey, who talked very candidly about the issues he faces in a smaller setting. He spoke of uh, the challenges in Iraq and Syria and Ukraine. At one point, he turned to Leslie Stahl, the moderator, and said, this is a tour de nightmare. Uh, tonight, we're going to shift focus a little bit and talk uh, in significant part about the Asia Pacific because uh, to our good fortune, Admiral Greenert is just back from a very unusual uh, trip to China where he met with the commander of the Chinese uh, PLA Navy, Admiral Wu, uh, on a four-day visit. Uh, this is, I believe, the fourth uh, visit you've had with Admiral Wu in the last year. And as, as General Dempsey said last, last night, military to military cooperation with China um, has probably never been as close in the, in the modern era as this. And yet, as we know from reading the newspapers, this last year has been a, a year in which Chinese behavior has been very worrisome uh, to its neighbors uh, in the Asia Pacific region and, and to some extent to us. So I want to ask Admiral Greener to begin by telling us about uh, his, his visit uh, to uh, China, I have a, a number of specific questions, but let me just start by asking you uh, what your basic takeaway was after spending four days with these folks. Thank you, David. Before I start, I got to thank Chuck again. You know, if he had filled in, it would have been just fine because we appeared before the Senate Armed Services Committee together, so he knew what I was supposed to do <laughs> for the last three years, and he could have just repeated that. Uh, this was a, a, an extraordinary visit uh, with Admiral Wu, and uh, what it was was it's a, called a counterpart visit. Uh, he had come to the United States in September of uh, last year, and we sat down and we looked at each other and said, uh, are we going to trust each other? We have to figure that out. Our two presidents just met at Sunnylands and said uh, that we are going to find uh, ways to build confidence and cooperation, not conflict. And that was passed down to the Secretary of Defense, and Secretary Hagel passed it down and said, you guys get to work, the requisite services. So we sat down, Admiral Wu and I, and we wrote down eight things that we thought we could do to move ahead in this. We could, the Rim of the Pacific exercise that took place, uh, he had some ideas on learning more about carriers, personnel exchanges, more exercises. I should just note the Chinese have been part of these 22 nation yeah. RIMPAC exercises, which are still going on as we speak. So what this really was, was my, my coming back to him and saying, all right, it's been since September, where are we? Uh, where do you want to go from here? So we actually sat down. Of those eight things that we sat down, two are reconciled. They're at the Rim of the Pacific, called RIMPAC, and they're doing fine. They're doing about average compared to all the other fleets, which is interesting. We can talk about that if you like. And that sounds reassuring, actually. <laughs> average is good. It's good enough. It's not what they thought. It's a little difficult, multinational exercises. And then the other one was they, they want to learn a lot more about our carriers by coming aboard our carriers with experts. And we said, well, we're not ready for that. But <laughs> we're ready for the remaining six uh, because, uh, to me, we have to manage our way through this. We have to manage our way through behavior. We have to manage our way through the fact that we have 40-year-old uh, people commanding ships, and we have civilian mariners out in the South China Sea, and we have to have consistent means of behavior and protocols. So we sat down and went through that, and it was a good visit. It was frank. It was respectful. Uh, and then he opened some things up that I really wasn't sure we were going to do. I went aboard their carrier. I'm the first uniformed person. I think you know Secretary Hagel went out there uh, on board the carrier a few months ago. And we went, uh, not stem to stern, but threw out a lot of it. Then we went to a submarine. Then we went to uh, a destroyer, about a, about a 2,000 ton, about a length of, uh, almost the length of a football field. Uh, and then a, one of their patrol craft. And we walked through it, answered a lot of questions, and met with their crew. They brought about half, no, maybe about uh, 
20% of their crew of the carrier sat down and we uh, shared some stories and they asked me some questions. Uh, talked with their staff and then uh, one last thing I would mention to you which uh, I asked to meet with really there it's called the the State Ocean Administration it's the the unity it's the entity that commands their Coast Guard if they will and had a discussion with them on behavior and where they want to go. So I, I want to get in a minute to the issues of, of the, that the Coast Guard is dealing with in the in the South China Sea and the East China Sea but first uh, I want to ask you about this Chinese aircraft carrier uh, this is, uh, as, as we read, a former Ukrainian yeah. uh, commissioned aircraft carrier, and it's led to a lot of uh, anxiety in, in the Asia Pacific and among some of your colleagues in, in the U.S. Navy about China's aspirations uh, to build a deep water navy. So let me just ask you first, what's it look, you know, what kind of ship is the Liaoming? How are they doing uh, in operating it? Do, do they seem to have the level of sophistication that, that you think they'll be uh, uh, able to really operate that and project power in their region? Well, uh, it's very Russian. It means it's big, it's heavy, and it's onerous. And so what they have done is what I would say, it's like buying a, a big old house, and then you take everything out of it, all the appliances, you strip it all down to just the basic structure, and everything they put in is very modern and Chinese. And you could see that. They have remodeled the carrier to the, to the point where about 65% of the weight and, and the, uh, the material inside is Chinese. So that's kind of one. So it's modern inside. Two, they took it to a shipyard in Dalian, which is up north, and it's very modern, very big. And they turned it over to them and said, fix this thing up, and if you do well, you'll build the next one. So that's going well. They will build another carrier probably relatively soon. It'll look just like this one, they said, ski ramp. Uh, about the same tonnage, 65,000, 70,000 tons. Uh, so it is, it, it's rudimentary by our standards. We, we launch and recover aircraft in a day, we could do 100. They're, they do maybe 10. Uh, they have a series of maybe 10 test pilots that are you know, taking off and landing. But they're moving on a pace that is extraordinary. It's a research and development ship for them. Uh, they may take it further out, but they haven't taken any further in the South China Sea without aircraft. Uh, they've taken it in the Yellow Sea, close to land, with aircraft. So they're just, they're just moving along right Did now. Did you ask Admiral Wu or, or others on this visit how they intend to use this aircraft carrier and future ones they may build? And are, are you worried about their ability to project power uh, in the Asia Pacific where we've been so dominant? I did ask him. Uh, he said this is for research and development for us to develop what will be a blue water aircraft carrier Navy. And uh, it, I think that he may be wanting to do this on his watch. He's got about four and a half more years to, to do what? To have this carrier out to sea like we do with a series of destroyers around it uh, and the ability to launch and recover aircraft in the 10s and maybe 20s. But uh, I'm not overly concerned right now. They have a lot of work to do. That's number one, before they can even come close to what we can do. Two, it's, it's big. It's an aircraft carrier. You have to protect it. You have to, every time something takes off, it's got to come back and land unless you're going to go ashore. And then why do you have an aircraft carrier if you can't operate away from shore? Uh, so it becomes a liability in a strange sense, uh, and, uh, and th there's a lot of, lot of work to be done. I'm not really concerned at this point. Let me also ask you about uh, the exercises that you mentioned, RIMPAC, which are off the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, there are members of Congress who ha have been critical uh, of the administration of the Navy for inviting the Chinese to take part in this exercise, basically saying uh, the Chinese have been very aggressive in, in, the, in the region in the last year. And why are we re rewarding aggression by inviting them to join uh, this operation, observe what we're doing, learn from us, learn new skills that they could end up using to threaten their neighbors and, and even the United States? Well, um, the Russians have come to RIMPAC uh, for some time and uh, off and on, but they've been an invitee uh, and there's been no squabble about that. Uh, look, the fact is the Chinese are a member of, a, of a, if you will, a neighborhood out there and uh, the Pacific. 
Uh, they are a growing navy in concert with a growing economy. We want them to come and operate with, if you will, the, the neighborhood, with responsible uh, uh, nations and navies. A lot of what we did out there was building uh, communication, was building uh, professionalism, was building medical expertise, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, counter piracy, counter smuggling. Uh, we weren't out there doing missile exercises and anti-submarine warfare and some say, you know, giving away the farm. It, it really wasn't that. There is exposure, there's no question, but there's exposure both ways. Uh, so it is, in my view, something we have to manage through, we have to develop with them, and with that engagement can come perhaps shaping. And I'd be interested to know what uh, deficiencies you saw in terms of their uh, operating capability. You mentioned that they were kind of middle of the pack. Um, what, are they, what are they not doing as well as, as some others? Well, it's, uh, it's difficult to join a multinational exercise as a newcomer. Uh, it tends to be uh, communications and, of course, there's always uh, uh, translation. That, that becomes an issue. But they did some gunnery exercises and they did okay. Uh, like I said, average compared to others. So I guess maybe they could improve that. But they were improving by the end. Uh, some of their equipment was not ready for doing things like uh, takedowns, counter piracy, uh, counter smuggling. You send small boats in the water, go over, take a ship down. Uh, it's just getting used to it. Uh, make no mistake, they have modern equipment. They have motivated crews. Uh, they are professional. Uh, it's just working together and building up. So, uh, but they had some hitches. And give us your uh, sense after this visit uh, of the maritime uh, issues of tension and even confrontation in the uh, South China Sea and the East China Sea. Um, I, I'd be interested in, in what you learned if you raised those issues with uh, Admiral, Admiral Wu, and also um, what you think can be done to deconflict uh, our Navy's operations and, and those of the Chinese. One of the incidents over the last year that was worrisome was I don't know if it's right to say a near collision, but a pretty close call, a 100-yard margin between U.S. Navy ships that were operating and, and Chinese ships that were getting too darn close. So t t tell us about that. Uh, I know that one of the issues you're thinking about is something that you're calling the code for unplanned encounters at sea. Uh, if that came up in, in seriously in your discussions, tell us about that. Sounds like something the Pentagon would make up, right? Q is, well, uh, I gotta have an acronym. It's, it, Q, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave the, yes, Q's is what we're gonna call. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that was international, all right? We didn't make it up. But anyway, seriously, I have a, a picture, if I could put up, uh, which shows what we all refer to as the nine dash line. The nine dash line is a, imagine a dash line that starts up in and around Japan. You come down through the Philippines, work your way around Malaysia, in, in that lower dip around, and that's, that defines the South China Sea. Uh, the, the Chinese have come forward and said, hey, uh, this is our water now. This is uh, our near sea, and, uh, the, and the islands within it, many of them are ours. And we said, excuse me, but you know, we missed that memo. In other words, what is it that, that this is based on? It is not based on an international process. And uh, what is that basis? Because we need to talk about this. So, you know, David, that becomes the kind of the essence of the squabble. The islands within it, they say they're ours. Uh, the, the, we, the international norms are you have a land mass, and then there's a distance from that, 12 miles is territorial seas, 120 miles is what we call the exclusive economic zone, where you have some control or regulation over foreign entities operating in there for various reasons. That's the essence of the squabble. Within that Nash nine dash line, that South China Sea, there are several islands and shoals, and Vietnam, Taiwan, the Philippines, Malaysia, all have various claims to them dating way back. The Chinese are a little late to this in making this claim, they haven't really, if you will, filed it or brought it to an international forum. So again, how, what do we do now? Well, we're, we're talking about it. We've been very straightforward. You should bring this to an international forum. You should come and talk about it. Any squabbles, any disagreements need to be managed diplomatically, not pushing around, not aggressive. And, and that's where, that is our policy. In the meantime, to me, I use the word again, we have we have ships out there operating. We've been in the Western Pacific for decades and we're not leaving. And they recognize that. Admiral Wu said, I know you're out here and I know you're gonna grow out here. I'm okay with that. 
we need, but I need to work this through. I have rules too. So the point is we need a protocol, a set of protocols that we all agree to, and that's that, uh, that's that conduct for unplanned encounters at sea. And I'm wondering whether you think the Navy should be in the business of, of signaling to, to the Chinese day to day that we and our, our, our allies and friends in the, in the Pacific do not accept uh, the Chinese Nine Dash Line and that we're going to be present uh, to make sure that they don't s seek to take advantage of, of this claim that, which, that we, don't, uh, we don't think is, is justified. I mean, should, should, should our ship, for example, when the Chinese move into Vietnam, what we regard as Vietnamese waters with a, an oil dr drilling rig, uh, what should we do about that, if anything? Well, it's, it's disputed water. That was actually uh, a distance outside of the territorial waters of Vietnam. It was in waters that, again, they claim, and so did China. So we say uh, aggression is not the way to solve this. Bumping, ramming is not the way. Somebody's going to get hurt. And miscalculation, once again, we, we send out 40-year-old uh, civilian mariners. I use that name. That's young in my book. And they have limited experience. And they have our sailors with them. And they have Chinese sailors, Vietnamese sailors. We need a, a consistent management of protocol, you know, a, a way to, to behave out there. And then meanwhile, our policymakers sit down and work this out using the international process, the uh, United Nations uh, Law of the Sea, Convention for Law of the Sea Tribunal, and other means. So we do state up, up front, if challenged, uh, that you are in our waters, that no, these are international waters. Our folks have that protocol, uh, and the Chinese expect it. And what would you say if, if a naval officer from the Philippines or from Japan or from Vietnam uh, said to you, Admiral Greenard, I saw the pictures of you during your uh, visit uh, to China with uh, Admiral Wu, and they made me nervous. Uh, here's, a, here's a country that's trying to push its weight around, and our uh, friend and, and we hope protector of the United States uh, rather than uh, you know focusing on our our worries, is is trying to do more military to military cooperation. Um, what would you what would you say to that? Because um, I bet you'll get this question to that Japanese or Philippine officer. Well, there's a few things I could say. One, um, here's a picture of your chief of navy with the rest of us at the Western Pacific Naval Symposium in Shingdao in April, where we all signed the conduct for unplanned encounters at sea because we have a, a forum, and a series of forums, if you will, fora, where we get together and, and we do that. Uh, we have counterpart visits where the Korean Navy, the, actually the Japanese government, uh, is Chinese government, are looking for an opportunity to maybe develop the means to start a, a communication. But you know, I'd go back to uh, 1987, uh, whenever the, the chairman of the Soviet military you may recall, came to the United States at the invitation of Admiral Crow, who said, we have to have dialogue, regardless of the differences, or there's, it's not that there's no hope, there's great risk. And that led to a conversation with my predecessor, Admiral Carl Trost, and the head of the Soviet Navy. So uh, these, there are communications going, around, uh, going, uh, going on, if you will, uh, internationally, uh, in several instances, and uh, we have to continue it, in my view. I, I think most of us would probably think that at a time of rising tensions, uh, the ability to, to communicate uh, with people who might uh, pose threats is a, is a, is a good thing. Um, so uh, I'm sure you'll be conveying that message to Japanese and Philipp Philippine officers and also to members of the U.S. Congress. Yes. Um, I want to ask you one uh, final China question, and it's, it's a kind of long-range uh, question you hear discussed increasingly in Washington. Uh, it's, it's obvious to people who look at our rising production of uh, shale oil and gas that we are becoming uh, – in a way we didn't imagine a decade ago, an energy superpower, and that our need for oil from the Persian Gulf, one of the main reasons that we've insisted on having uh, dominance as a deep water navy is gonna be less. Others will need that Middle East oil, but you know, we'll need it uh, less here in the United States. So you, you hear people ask whether 
the Chinese as arguably the people who most depend on those energy supplies in the future should play a greater role uh, in the very expensive job of keeping the sea lanes open. And I want to ask you, as the Chief of Naval Operations, whether you think uh, we should uh, plan for a world in which we hope to have China as a partner in protecting the sea lanes, or whether that's radically contrary to our interests and we should do what we can to prevent it. Well, I think, uh, again, to be, res my opinion, to be responsible members of the world order and needing the energy you just described in Malacca and Hormuz, but we're hyper-connected, as Thomas Friedman says, all around the world. We need to keep all of the crossroads, all of the straits open. But uh, I could see that. Uh, I've asked Admiral Wu, when are you going to go further with what you're doing, which is, today, they have three ships in the Gulf of Aden doing counter-piracy patrols. By the way, joining them are two Japanese ships, a Korean ship, a Bangladeshi ship, and a Turkish ship. So uh, they're not all holding hands out there, but they are doing the business of keeping those waterways open. Uh, another opportunity could present itself in a countermine. Uh, as, uh, you know, recently the Japanese are talking about this concept of collective self-defense. Uh, one example that the uh, Prime Minister uh, Abe uses is uh, being able to participate in countermine to keep the Strait of Hormuz open. That's, that is an international responsibility, I believe, to, if, because internationally we're connected, we need those waterways open for all of our economies and all of our energy. So I hear you saying that a world in the future where the Chinese see a role for their Navy in, let's say, helping keep the Strait of Hormuz, this, uh, the Strait of Malacca, these key uh, waterways, keep them open, uh, is something that we would not regard as a threat. I would not. Uh, I'll give you another example. Today we are, as you know, we're doing hydrolysis on some very bad chemical weapons. We're doing this in the Mediterranean with one of our ships. Protecting those ships and the passage to and from Syria and that are Chinese ships, Russian ships, Korean ships, again, NATO ships, it's, it's uh, we can do this. Uh, and I think done correctly, it, it shouldn't be viewed a threat if we do this deliberately and properly using the international processes we have in place. So I want to turn now to every uh, senior military officer's favorite subject, which is the budget. Uh, we have been hearing uh, from General Odierno, from uh, uh, General Dempsey, uh, tales of uh, woe, tales of, of real difficulty ahead because of uh, sequestration under, under the Budget Control Act. Uh, as we've been hearing the message over the last two days, it sounds like this, that for, for this year and next year, thanks to some fixes that Congress enacted, uh, the, the severe crisis uh, can, be, can be postponed, but come 2016 and years beyond that, uh, we have a real problem. General Dempsey sure got my attention uh, last night when he said, I think I heard him say this right, we will no longer be immune from coercion in, in the world that's ahead. That was a pretty t t tough statement for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to, to make. So I want to ask you from the perspective of the Navy uh, how this issue looks. And let me ask you to start with the basic symbol of American uh, power projection, which is aircraft carriers. Uh, under what you currently have to assume is the budget picture going forward, what's going to happen with our aircraft carrier fleet? Well, if we have this scenario, the Budget Control Act, we'll, we'll go to at least 10. We have uh, 10 today building one, and it's almost done, which would take us to 11. We would go to 10 as a minimum. The aircraft carrier George Washington, which is kind of a subject of discussion, uh, we have put money in our budget in 15, looking towards 16 to take her in, remove the fuel, and prepare for either retirement or refueling and, and further overhaul. And that 16 budget will be key. That happens in 16 and 17. So we're, we'll have at least 10 aircraft carriers. That's not enough, David. That's not enough to meet the presence and the requirements of the world today as defined by the geographic combatant commanders. Now, I know I saw something uh, on a Navy 
information site that said the number of aircraft carriers, in fact, could go down to eight. Is 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 that a? This was assuming again that that your budget control problems don't get better, but 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 stay where they are. Well, the, there's a. That's feasible. I mean, given a certain set of circumstances, a certain budget level, which I, I don't know what the speculation of that budget level was, uh, it could go down as low as eight. And the, the issue becomes, if you can't afford to refuel the carrier in 16, the next one comes along four years later. Is there more money then? And if not, you know, what happens to that one? Okay, so you don't refuel that one. And then you see you're on a different road here. Yeah, you know, what does that mean to the, re the industrial base for repair? Uh, my biggest concern under sequestration is our ship industrial base because uh, we'd have to take a balanced reduction, if you will, build less ships in the future uh, and retire some ships early because we've got to sustain our people. When we've had budget adjustments in the past, we developed what some, uh, a, an issue which some call the hollow force. The, the, the issue with that part was we had a, a force of people who were unmotivated on drugs, uh, they weren't getting trained and their morale was bad and they weren't, we weren't retaining them. And that spiraled down and that took us 15 years to recover from. So if we have this period of say a budget reduction and then all of a sudden money comes back, we've got to get the people right. So the balance becomes the shipbuilding plan, the aircraft plan, and the number of ships we have today. One uh, key issue thinking about, about the money that you're going to have um, is uh, the replacement of the Ohio class um, uh, nuclear submarines, which are part of our uh, nuclear deterrent force, key part of it. Um, and, and looking at, at some material, getting ready to, to talk to you, I saw that the first of these Ohio replacement uh, submarines uh, I think due to come online uh, in 2021 will cost $9 billion and that follow-on ships will cost uh, $6 billion at least. And I think the question that, that we would ask you as you try to juggle scarce resources is, is whether the Navy and the country can afford a ship that costs $9 billion. Yeah, I understand. That's a good question. Uh, first, the, uh, we're part of what's called the triad, and we are the undersea part. That is the most survivable, the most reliable, and uh, the one in the future which will carry at least 70% of the burden uh, for our strategic nuclear deterrence. That's a policy set by others uh, that deliver to us, and we organize, train, equip, and provide those forces, as you mentioned, the, in this case, the Ohio submarine. Its replacement, the Ohio replacement, the first which carries the burden of some of the research and development, will cost uh, nine billion dollars inflated to those to those terms. Uh, you're building this to last 50 years, so the technology, the quieting, and all that goes with it uh, is really postured to be able to, again, if you amortize that, and I'm not saying, hey, it's a bargain, I'm saying you have to think through a 50-year process here. And that's what it costs. We've scrubbed this thing a lot of ways uh, in the Department of Defense. Uh, and that is expensive, and we're looking to drive it down, but it's made a cost. Another uh, issue that I found uh, scary um, involves your uh, basic nuclear technology. You told Congress earlier this month that uh, the cuts that you're making to your naval reactors program are no longer sustainable, and if, if, I, if I read this right, that you can't, given the cuts that are uh, proposed, you can't guarantee safety, reliability, and development of the nuclear Navy going forward with these numbers. Is that true? Uh, yes, you have to put a comma, and there was, and do the required research, and do the required training, and so my point is, David, we would always have safe and reliable nuclear reactors that's where we would have to, the proponents of the, of the money. And as you can see, the good Lord has just said that he agrees with me when you heard that rumble. I think that was a delayed response to a $9 billion <laughs> ship. <laughs> but uh, no, the, the point is, uh, 
that same budget, as well as uh, doing the safety of our plants, does the research and development for the next nuclear reactor, and also trains all of our nuclear kids. And to do that training, as established by Admiral Rico years ago, and what made that program so strong, was they train on uh, actual nuclear reactors, small training uh, reactors, and it's a very, very high standard uh, process. I want to ask you, because you are a submariner, you commanded four, you commanded one submarine, you served on four. Uh, I was told by uh, one of your uh, 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 junior officers that uh, you were in fact the first submariner to be chief of naval operations in 20 years. And I want to ask you uh, what the world looks like uh, if you're a submariner. And by that I mean um, there are a lot of areas where American military dominance uh, is challenged. But uh, people uh, make the point to me that undersea is not one of them. That this uh, is an area of, at present, basically total American dominance. We can go anywhere and basically do anything. And I want to ask you, um, you know, is, is that going to continue? I other countries have got to be building submarines at a rapid rate. We read about Iranian submarines. We read about all kinds of countries. And I want to ask you, is that dominance you have now something that you think can be sustained? Yes, I do. I really do. Uh, you mentioned the cost of an Ohio-class uh, replacement. And uh, uh, that kind of technology and that kind of quieting and that kind of um, reliability in your systems is what makes us uh, what I call own the undersea domain. We can't go anywhere we need to. I have a lot of empirical data that I get as the chief of naval operations. And I think uh, we're, we are good for uh, about a decade, and just under a decade uh, for that, but we must look ahead and continue, as you mentioned before, to uh, be vigilant and, and invest to be dominant and own that undersea domain. We owe that to the country, to the citizens, as something we just won't be challenged on. And I want to ask, uh, before we turn to the audience for, for, for your question, something that I asked you when we met uh, a year or so ago. Um, I was in China uh, a couple years ago, and I uh, interviewed one of their defense experts who teaches us at, at a university near, near, near Shanghai. And I asked him whether uh, Chinese uh, military experts are reading Alfred Thayer Mahan, the great theorist of sea power. And he said, uh, well, yes, we read it, but it's kind of a, an historical exercise for us. I mean, you know, although we are going to build aircraft carriers, we don't see challenging you ship for ship as a deep water navy as something that makes any sense for us. We want to be able to take out your ships if we have to. We want to have, we want to leap over this generation of technology to the next one, to the disabling technologies, cyber, beam, uh, all kinds of uh, new weapons that, 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 that lie ahead. And we're not going to spend money on these enormously expensive systems that America does. And it made me think, as I, as I said to you when we talked in, in your office, that, that I was worried that we would spend these billions, hundreds of billions of dollars maintaining our dominance in what I call legacy systems. You know, we're going to build the best mainframe computers forever, by golly. And meanwhile, people are going to, including the Chinese, maybe especially the Chinese, are going to jump over that legacy system technology into a new space. And we're going we're gonna to end up regretting that we spent so much and wish we'd spent more on unmanned vessels, unmanned submarines, the kinds of things that challenge the Air Force in, in the world of uh, unmanned. So t talk about that and the, the, how you view legacy systems, if you will, and, and new technologies and how to get that right. Well, first, uh, there's a say-do gap, what you say and what you do. And so I go back to my trip. I just left uh, Lushan Base, Dalian. Uh, and, I, and of course the Chinese have come to uh, Hawaii. They're building aircraft carriers that are conventional, number one, so that's gonna need a lot of fuel. And number two, they gotta take them out to sea. They're looking very, they replicate a lot of what we did and, uh, and that's the path they're on right now, David, I would tell you. So this leap is, I don't see it yet. 
Uh, let me tell you a few things. Number one, uh, we, we're looking at lasers, and as we speak, we have a laser gun in the Arabian Gulf on a ship that we are testing. Uh, it's been demonstrated shooting down a drone and, if you will, uh, overheating uh, a fast uh, craft uh, at this level of power. And so we're taking it out there to see how does it operate at sea. Uh, we have unmanned aerial vehicles that we're, we've launched and recovered on an aircraft carrier. Next, put a program in place to continue to do that. We have unmanned underwater vehicles, and uh, we expect to have autonomous underwater vehicles that can search, uh, bring a, uh, information, come up to the surface, send the information, go back down. We'll be deploying that within about three years. So we're into unmanned, uh, we're into laser, uh, we're into cyber in many, many ways that, you know, beyond the classification of what we're talking here. Uh, we're into power systems for the unmanned underwater vehicles that can go on for long periods of time. So I, too, agree. We, you know, just more kinetic, more missiles, that's not the way ahead. The way is the electromagnetic spectrum to get in and spoof, to jam, to uh, fry, if you will, micro. Uh, and uh, that's the way of the future for us as well. I should, I should ask, um, before we turn to the audience, whether you had any conversations with Admiral Wu about cyber. Uh, the, you know, this has become a huge issue between our, the U.S. and China, and does that come up in, in mill-mill discussions? It did uh, in September, and uh, that was before, of course, the, uh, the indictment. But there, I was, when I was in Beijing, that was the fourth conversation that was taking place. There was the... Uh, the strategic security uh, dialogue that was taking place. There was a security and economic dialogue. And then we had a host of, uh, of DOD staff and Navy staff talks. They were talking cyber. I, I wanted to move on with the agenda that we had, Admiral Wu and I had, and not lose that time to move ahead with you know, our cooperative measures. But at dinner, we talked about cyber a little bit. And uh, what, what did he say? <laughs> not much. <laughs> You know, he, he doesn't want to get he indicted. He said, I have bosses and rules, and you have bosses and rules. It's a favorite line we both use. So let me uh, turn to the audience, and I'm going to ask you, please, um, to identify yourself, to keep your questions uh, short, and as people have been saying, keep them questions. Yes, sir. Good evening, CNO. Thank you for joining us. Don Lauren, retired destroyer sailor, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. Uh, thanks for taking a very long journey and making it longer by coming here, so we appreciate that. Uh, you gave an absolutely invigorating set of remarks in Newport about strategy recently. Uh, I think many of us saw it on YouTube. Uh, and uh, you sort of challenged people for a strategy for the future. If you take a look at some of the existing things we have, it's time to go beyond, forward, from the sea, from the sea, those things. And it can be claimed that the strategic initiatives of 2012 and the QDR of this year are in fact budget justifications, not a real strategy. Could you share with us what you might think the pillars or the tenets of uh, the strategy you would like to see for the future and taking advantage of uh, General Jacoby being here, how you see the U.S. Navy's role in not only defending the homeland but ensuring the security of the homeland? Well, defending the homeland, security of the homeland is pry one, uh, and it's concomitant with strategic nuclear deterrence. So when I do my budget, I see to it that that money uh, is put into a place that is acceptable, that I think I have met my, my requirements for that. Over to Chuck, then he gives me his comments, the debate begins. But in the end, he gets what he needs. To, to your other point, for us, uh, one of the first, strategic nuclear deterrence, homeland defense. Any strategy has to have that. Number two, it has to involve presence. We need to be where it matters, when it matters. We need to be out shaping, and if something goes wrong, immediately be able to respond to that. Uh, next, we have to be able to project power for years you know, overseas. Not surging so much, but be able to come together and project power. That has to be part and parcel to it. We need to be able to respond with special forces and support our special forces. So th those are some key elements right there. The presence piece, it has a subset to it, Don. It's a very large pillar, and you know, rather than dragging this on, but, but those to me are very key elements. And I tell my kids, 
when you think of anything, as long as I'm the CNO, war fighting is first, operate forward and be ready. And those tenants put those lens on and look at those pillars and tell me, how are you doing in those, those regards? That to me is how I've directed our guys to build our strategy, simply put. So I see a hand all very far in the back, the gentleman in the back row, yes sir. Thank you, Admiral Greenertz. Uh, my name is Monty Kang. I'm with the World Affairs Council of Orange County, California. A few years ago, in 2011, I attended a similar conference to this in Washington, and we went to the Indian Embassy. At that time, the ambassador and President Obama had just gone to India that evening, so the first secretary of the embassy had pointed out that the U.S. Navy and the Indian Navy were conducting, at that time, in 2011, the largest joint naval exercises in the world. Now, as you know, historically, India has had some rivalry with China. Uh, are these exercises still being conducted? Are they still classified as the largest? And what are your uh, thoughts on, on, on that? Yes, that exercise is called Malabar. And uh, that has been a pretty comprehensive exercise with the Indian Navy that we've been doing for at least two decades. At that time, it was at its largest. And what made it the largest was they brought their aircraft carrier and air wing and their submarines out, and so did we. And we, uh, we did joint exercises under the sea. That's varsity exercise in that you can trust you won't run into each other under the sea and, and in the air. And we exchanged pilots. It, it was remarkable. Regrettably, we've sort of digressed from the com comprehensiveness and complexity uh, of that exercise. But it is alive and well. Uh, we just conducted it not long ago, and it involved frontline destroyers as well as the uh, what's called the stealth destroyer, which uh, means it's uh, fit very well to deflect radar and also has some very good radar absorbing material and has a great, great set of uh, sensors and weapons. So my point is, I think we're back on an upslope. Uh, we'll see where uh, Prime Minister Modi wants to go and, and how we develop from there. But we are open to that in a, in a deliberate manner, and we haven't lost contact. Yes, yes, sir. The, the gentleman here in the middle, uh, if we can get a microphone to him. Alan, Alan Ace, uh, retired Gavi. Uh, sir, uh, if we went to war with China tomorrow, what would be the two weapons you'd be most worried about the Chinese using? It's certainly not their carrier force. Well, uh, they have uh, an extraordinary cruise missile, uh, selection of cruise missiles, and, and ballistic missile force that they've developed. So the question is where we're going to war. If it's in their backyard, I'm a little worried about their ballistic missile because of its reach. Uh, and that's both land, depending on where... Again, it, you're, we would speculate on the scenario. But what I would tell you is that those are two uh, systems they've invested uh, highly in, those two, the cruise missile and the, and the ballistic missile. And, and just to follow up on that, what would you say to, to a criticism that's made uh, in Washington increasingly that your plans for the literal combat ship uh, need to be rethought because those uh, ships are not just not... Um, uh, they don't have the, the firepower to defend themselves against the kinds of weapons the Chinese, uh, in particular, could, could bring to bear. Yeah, the, uh, the criticism of the literal combat ship is they say it's not survivable and it doesn't have enough lethality. Uh, I would tell you this, the ship today, by all the tests that it has gone through, all the required tests, is living up to what we ask the builder to design to and build to the specifications. So the question is, well, we want you to rethink that. Well, it is built to sort of replace what we call a frigate, and it's, a, it's a, about, a, again, about just short of a football field in length. Uh, we call it a small surface combatant. And, and we said we wanted something agile and flexible that you could put, it'd be modular. You could do anti-submarine warfare, bring it into port, and 72 hours later send it out and do mine warfare, bring it into port, and in 72 hours or less, send it out and do anti-surface. And that would be swarming, you know, small boats and that. And again, we're on that track. The, uh, the concept of survivability, it, it kind of has three factors. One, how susceptible are you to getting hit? Uh, somebody shoots something at you, either you can run away from it, you're, you're agile and you're moving, or you shoot it down. Uh, number two, once you get hit, how vulnerable are you? Do you have enough, uh, you know, halon, fire systems, 
flooding, you know, anti-flooding systems encounter? And then lastly, can it recover? Can you, you know, take that hit and return to port? Or do you want to keep fighting? What is your design? We designed that ship to take a hit and be able to retire, to go home. Uh, and so far, it's living up to that. Uh, we've been asked to, Secretary Hagel said, take another look uh, as we look at the follow-on that we're going to build. And that's what we're doing this summer. Good. Um, so, uh, yes, ma'am, the, the, the woman in the, in the second row here, please. Emma Greener, regarding the defense and Please uh, identify yourself. Sorry. Um, I'm Emma Barnett from Deloitte Consulting. Um, and re question regarding the defense industrial base, actually. You were quoted um, saying you had concern regarding supply chain visibility and you had concern going down because parts, particularly I think in regard to your submarines, were not, you didn't really have visibility into Bob's submarine valve shop. Um, to what tier do you really have visibility and how much of a security concern is that for you? Well, the, uh, the con the, what I was concerned about were second and third tier vendors, people that, that make specialized valves for high pressure hydraulics, high pressure air, uh, radioactive liquid, and also uh, nuclear instrumentation chips and those kind of components. They, one half of all of the folks that build nuclear material are sole source. That means there's one of them. That's the visibility I want to, that I think we need to have because I'd like to know how are you doing because if I cause you to go out of business by the way I'm ordering or by a loss of industrial base, I'm in big trouble and uh, I have to reconstitute that. That is very pricey. So how much visibility do I have? We have good visibility down to all the vendors. What I don't have visibility is how are you doing and uh, how do we work together to buy efficiently and effectively to keep these guys running. Uh, yes. Hold, hold on, just wait for the microphone, it's coming right to you. John Moore, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel Air Force, retired. Uh, we talked about the Chinese naval power. What about the Russians, now that they have the Crimea? And several years back, they were talking about their increasing the size, they're going back and putting more money into their Navy. How is that looking? Well, in the naval sense, uh, the Russians have invent invested uh, quite a bit, a uh, billion U.S. dollars, in their industrial base to build submarines at first and then surface ships. So they are uh, pretty much focused on first a proper uh, strategic deterrent and then, and then a submarine force that is effective to protect it. And they've been very upfront about that. And, uh, and it's shown that, yes, in fact, that's what they're doing. Uh, I would assume the uh, surface combatants would come next. Haven't seen much uh, of their air or their intentions with regard to their naval air. They have more operating money, therefore, you know, more fuel. Therefore, you, you will see and hear more about them flying more because that's just money they didn't have before. I'm going to take the uh, opportunity to ask the last question myself, and that is uh, the following. This is a period in which the Russians are behaving aggressively in Ukraine and keep going through uh, uh, ignoring the signals we're trying to send. This is a period in which China is behaving aggressively uh, in its uh, uh, sphere in, in East Asia. Are you concerned that the credibility of American power, I'm not talking about American power itself, but the credibility of American power is diminished. And is there anything you'd like to see uh, as a naval officer to address that? Uh, in the world that I live in and that I control, I would tell you that we don't see that aggressiveness at sea toward us. That I see, uh, and the, the Russian Navy has been professional, with very few exceptions. And on those exceptions, uh, we've provided a demarche, which is a, a uh, complaint, if you will, through the State Department, uh, at behavior outside the norms to which they agreed. And they've responded to those and behaved. Uh, the Chinese have recently, you mentioned the, the near collision. Uh, there's a follow-on to that story. After that near collision, the commanding officer of the aircraft carrier, in English, called over and said, what's going on over there? Commanding officer of the Kalpins, which was the U.S. cruiser involved in this near collision with the, 
said, I'm over here minding my business, or less, in international waters operating. He said, well, I'm doing some op. They worked it out from there, and, and this diffused this. So I'm not saying, uh, David, that there isn't uh, a, uh, a trend here of aggression and that, that we don't have some work to do, which I talked about early in this session. We do. I'm just not seeing it uh, against us as if you know, we're somehow diminished in the maritime domain. So let me close with a disclosure. Last year, the Secretary of the Navy announced that he was going to build a new guided missile destroyer, Arleigh Burke class, called the USS Paul R. Ignatius, named after my dad, who was Secretary of the Navy under President Johnson and who is a combat veteran of World War II. And I know if my dad were here, he would say, this is great, but Admiral Greenard, if you can't afford it, don't build it. <laughs> well, that's a good point. And I turn to America and, and you say, you know, we have to decide what kind of Navy do we want and what kind of sea power do we want and what are we willing to pay for. But whatever it is, uh, I would I'd leave you with this. Our uh, sailors remain astounding. They are amazing people. They are innovative. They are smart. They are driven. They join for a purpose. Uh, and they are out there feeling that what they're doing is important and resilient. And I take it as my sole responsibility to take good care of them, to enable them, and to, as we say, accelerate their lives. Because we've got to do that right. That's the foundation of our Navy and what has always made it great and the difference. Thanks. Thanks for getting here. Thanks so much.